There's a series of suttas about future dangers that King Ashoka once recommended that all monks and nuns listen to on a regular basis. And it's a recurring theme and the dangers of aging, illness, death, or if you're staying in the forest and the dangers all around you. In each case, you realize, I've got to practice so I can reach the un as yet unreached, attain the as yet unattained, realize the as yet unrealized. So that when aging, illness, and death can come, I wouldn't have to suffer from them. Now, the heedfulness there is in two things. One, in realizing that you have to get started on your practice right away, because death could come at any time, illness can come at any time. But also in the realization that you have to go someplace you've never been before. Because as long as you haven't experienced the deathless, you've never been in a really safe place. And if you just keep going to more unsafe places, you never find any real security. The implication here, of course, is that we're not coming from a position of original purity or original goodness. It's not that we're originally bad, either. Simply that the practice is not a return to someplace we've already been. There is that passage where the Buddha said the mind is luminous, and it's darkened by visiting defilements. But he's not saying that the mind is originally pure. This is a point that Ajahn Mahabhava makes. As he said, if the Buddha had said the mind is originally pure, you couldn't argue with him. If it was originally pure, then how did it get defiled? And if we were to bring it to purity again, what would keep it from getting defiled again? But the Buddha simply said, well, it's luminous. And luminosity is a quality of the mind that's not necessarily pure. After all, the mind simply in concentration is luminous. And as someone once pointed out, there's that passage in the canon that says that when the universe devolves, most beings go up to the Brahma levels. The levels that correspond to the fourth jhana, and hang out there until the new universe comes back into being, and then they fall. And so maybe we have an instinctive memory someplace. We've been someplace that's been luminous. That's the best place we've been so far, and we think we may want to go back. But then we'd fall again. We want something safer than that. If you don't think about rebirth, you can also think about the development of the animal kingdom. It's not that the case that as we evolve from single cell organisms up to multi cell organisms up to animals to human beings, that we left our original purity. Because animals all suffer. Remember hearing a Zen teacher one time said that animals don't suffer because they don't have any sense of self, but they have all the forms of clinging. They're sensuality clinging. They have a sense of the pleasures they want to find in life. Even views. They have to have a sense of how the world works in order to find their pleasures. They did an experiment years back with some pigeons. With some pigeons, they put them in, in a box, and they had two bars, a green bar and a red bar. You pushed the green bar, you got some food. You pushed the red bar, you didn't get any food. Those are very well-adjusted pigeons. They knew if they wanted food, they pressed the green bar. The red bar was just to play around with. In another box, they had pigeons where if you pressed the green bar, sometimes you got food and sometimes you didn't get food. 
And sometimes if you push the red bar, you got food, and sometimes you didn't get food. Those pigeons were basically berserk, very poorly adjusted pigeons. And what do I mean by poorly adjusted pigeons? They started doing strange, destructive things to themselves, which shows the connection not only between your idea of pleasure and how the world works, but also what you should do in order to get the world to work for you. Even common animals cling to that. And then their sense of self, that they live in a world which doesn't make any sense at all, where they can't figure out how to find happiness in the world. They start getting self-destructive, so their self, sense of self is damaged, which means that a healthy sense of self depends on having some sense of how the world works. And animals cling to these things. If they don't get what they want out of these things, then they start getting crazy. It's the same with us. We have our sensual desires, and then our sense of the world comes from how to satisfy those desires. We start thinking because of the problem of pain and how to get out of pain. As the Buddha said, we see that sensuality is the way out. And then we try to figure out the world so we can find the sensuality we want and figure out what we have to do within that world. And our sense of self, both as the provider for the happiness that we want and as the consumer of the happiness that we want, and the observer that's watching all this going on. They're all tied up in these things together. That's not something that only human beings have. As I said, even common animals have to have a rough sense of self and a rough sense of pleasure, a rough sense of figuring out how the world goes, or goes around and how it can man manipulate it through your actions. So we're all coming from clinging, clinging, clinging. We're not coming from a place of purity. Even those Brahmas up in the, the heavens that correspond to the fourth jhana, they're clinging really hard to that fourth jhana. This is not the case that we're going to be safe by going back to where we were. We have to realize we're going to try to find something that we haven't found before, which means we're going to have to be doing things we haven't done before. This is why it's so important to realize we're not simply going back to some place we've already been. I guess that would mean we simply do things that we used to do somehow. But here we're going someplace new. We're going beyond the luminosity of concentration, trying to figure out why do we cling? Why do we need to have this sense of identity around our pleasures? Is there some way we can live where we don't have to be beings, where we don't have to feed? That's what we're looking for. Because after all, the feeding involves clinging, and the clinging involves suffering. So we try to feed the mind well, strengthen it, so it can look into its attachments, look into its clingings and cravings, and figure out how we can let them go. This goes very much against the grain, which is why we hold to the Four Noble Truths as our guide, because they say there is a cause for suffering. And there is a cessation of the suffering by allowing the cause to cease. And there's a path of practice that can take us there. It's going to involve a lot of dispassion for our suffering and clinging. It's going to involve dispassion for our craving. So I have to keep in mind that map that the Buddha provides, the Four Noble Truths, that it will be good to abandon our attachments here. Dispassion for these things will be a good thing to develop. We take that on faith. 
as long as we haven't seen the deathless. When you see the deathless, that's when the Buddha says your conviction of the Buddha is confirmed. It's verified. And you're beginning to see what you hadn't seen before. There's still more work to do, but at least you have a toehold, or in the image in the canon, you've crossed the river to the point where you're not quite on the other shore, but your feet can reach the bottom. And you're not so likely to be swept away. You've reached a place of relative safety. And if you're really heedful, you want to get up on the shore. So remember, heedfulness is not simply a matter of saying, I've got to practice tonight more than I've done in the past, and I have to be more diligent in the practice. But also having the right concept of where you're going. You're trying to go to some place that's safe, and you don't want to let yourself rest content with anything that's not really safe. So when you do get into good states of concentration, remember they're the path. That was the Buddha's discovery. He'd been taught by his teachers that they were the goal. States of the dimension of nothingness, the dimension of neither perception or non-perception. But his realization was, okay, they're not the goal, but they can be the path. You learn how to reflect on them. You learn how to look at them to see where there's still some clinging in there. And letting go of that clinging is going to be, is going to be difficult, because after all, this is what defines us as beings. When the Buddha says, all beings subsist on food, it means all beings cling as part of their identity, what they are. So going someplace you've never been before, realizing something you never realized before, is going to require taking apart your sense of who you are. But we go on the conviction that the Buddha was right. If you learn how to let go of your clinging and craving, you do find ultimate happiness. You do find ultimate safety. a dimension where there are no dangers at all.